Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Simone Cavallaro, Director of the Stigler Center. Today we're happy to host Professor John Matsusaka and Ted, Co Ted Koser on the topic covered uh, in Matsusaka's new book, Let the People Rule, How Direct Democracy Can Meet the Populist Ch Challenge. The conversation will be moderated by Luigi Zingales. You can purchase the book from the seminary co-op by clicking the link uh, on our event page. Before we begin, please note, we're on the record. And if you have any questions for the speakers, we will address them in the last 15 minutes or so. You can submit them via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. As usual, views expressed by our guests are their own, not those of the Stigler Center or the University of Chicago. We hope that you will join us for more upcoming webinars. So please check our website, as well as our publication, promarket.org, and our podcast, Capital Isn't, co-hosted by Luigi and Bethany McLean, which just relaunched for a new season. Back to this afternoon. Please allow me to briefly introduce our speakers. John Matsusaka is the Charles Sexton Chair in American Enterprise, Professor of Finance and Business Economics, and the Executive Director of the Initiative and Referendum Institute at the University of South California. He is a frequent commentator in the media and is also a ProMarket Advisory Board member. Ted Koser is the Department Chair of Professor and Professor of Political Science at the University of California, San Diego. He's also a prolific, a prolific author and a frequent media commentator. Luigi Zingales is the Robert McCormack Distinguished Service Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at Booth and the Faculty Director of the Stigler Center. And now, without further ado, I turn it over to our speakers. Thank you. So thank you, Simone. And uh, we'll organize that uh, John is gonna talk for 15 minutes presenting the essence of his book and then Thad is gonna do a critical review. And then uh, we're gonna to start to have a conversation first with me and then uh, with uh, your question. Uh, John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luigi. And thanks, uh, thank you for inviting me and setting this up. And also thanks for everybody who's, who's watching this. And uh, thanks to Thad for uh, volunteering to discuss. So I'm looking forward to an excellent discussion. Um, I'm coming up, I'm sure. So I just have about 15 minutes and it seems like what I want to do is give you a very high level overview of the main arguments in, in the book. It's probably useful to put a little bit of context here to, to the book. I wrote the book for an educated non-academic audience. Um, and so uh, hopefully it's, it's easy to read, but it's, it's really tried to be grounded in, in really the latest social science research, uh, particularly work research in economics and political science, but also in law and in, in history as, as well. It's a, it's a contrarian book, and, and I wrote it because I thought there was a, a viewpoint that was out there uh, that, well, there was a viewpoint that wasn't out there uh, when it came to discussing populism and some of the challenges that, that the United States is facing in its democracy and other countries are facing in its democracy. Uh, so let me just go right, right into that. I don't wanna do a lot of slides because it's not very fun to, to look at slides, but let me just put up a couple slides here to, uh, to give you a sense <clears throat> of, the arguments. Let's see. Okay. So, so the book is about the, the the book is really started from a thinking about populism, and and I, I and I think that probably anybody who who's watching this or tuned into this. Uh, is aware that that populism is something that's going on around around the world. It's much discussed. It's controversial, and and there's a lot of uh, ideas about how to how to fix it or solve it or or make things better. I just want to start off by making sure we're talking about the same thing. So I put this this definition here, which is adapted from a from a dictionary definition. But when I talk about populism, and what I think most people have in mind is that we have in mind it's it's a political movement, uh, the core of which is the idea that ordinary people are being disregarded by elite groups that control the government. There's different versions or flavors of this, depending on where people come across the spectrum and where they are in the world. I would say that and a good example of, of the left wing of view of this would, would be espoused by Bernie Sanders. And really the, the, way, these, the way the different views vary is who they think the elites are. So, so in, a, in a Bernie Sanders or more of a left wing type of view, the elites are the 1%, uh, the plutocrats, corporations, and so forth. There's a right-wing version of this, which I think uh, Donald Trump espouses from time to time. In that case, the 1%, excuse me, the, the elites are 
are the media, academics, uh, the swamp, meaning, meaning um, um, technocrats within the government. Uh, there's also a, a, a European uh, version of this, uh, which the elites, uh, some of the anger toward elites is focused on um, bureaucrats in, in, uh, in Brussels, European Union bureaucrats who, who are pushing a globalist agenda. Uh, the point is that there's a whole bunch of different flavors of this, but they all have in common this idea that somehow government has slipped out of control of the people. So the first thing that I think is important to understand is, is that this, this, this feeling, this, this movement has not been created by the politicians. Uh, the politicians are taking advantage of something that's latent in the population. And, and there's, there's many, many ways to, to, to illustrate this. What I'm going to just show you is just one figure in the interest of time. Uh, you could produce many, many different figures of this. This is for the United States. It goes back about 70 years. And what this does is it shows the erosion of, of confidence that people have in the idea that government, uh, that, that, that ordinary people have a say in government. Again, you could ask this question a bunch of different ways. You could ask about trust in government. You could ask if government cares about people like me. Um, you could ask this for European countries as well. But they all show the picture, which you can see here, is that there has been a dramatic erosion of confidence uh, in government. And just to, just to put these numbers in perspective, in 1952, if you looked at people with college degrees, about 85, almost 90% of them said they believed that people, had, people like them had a say in government. Amongst high school, this is lesser educated people. You had 65, 70% said they believed that people like them had a say in government. And you can see what's happened over the subsequent 70 years. Here we are in 2016, which is the most recent data I had at the time. And you can see both of these groups are about 35% or, or lower. There's some volatility in here, of course, but the, but the basic point, which is really plain, is you can see that there's been this dramatic erosion of trust. So when the politicians are, are, are using populist messages, they're, 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 they're retailing a product that's already kind of pre-sold to, to the population. The population already, already believes this. The important debate that's been going on is, is why is this happening? And interestingly enough, the debate has been mostly in, in a, de a debate amongst elites, amongst pundits uh, in academia and amongst the media. And they, they really has been boiled down to two camps. The first camp is what I'll call the economics view. And, and that view is that, well, in some way with economic dislocation. So the typical story is you have blue collar workers who have been losing their jobs because of automation and globalization. And, and they're just frustrated that the government hasn't stepped in and, and helped them in some way. The other view is what I'll call the culture view, is that, is that uh, populism is coming somehow from immigration, uh, from somehow challenges to people's traditional values. Again, focused particularly on people in small towns, uh, the notion is they're resistant to, glo to globalization and, and economic integration. The, so, so these are the, these are the views that are, that, that are out there. The, the book, as I said, is contrarian, and, and the, book really, the book really wants to argue, it does argue that there's perhaps an, a third possibility here that really just isn't in the, in the public discourse space. Uh, and, that is, and that is, if you look at that picture, which I just put up there a, a minute ago, which shows the, the erosion, one thing you can see is it's been happening for a long time. So if we just look at, uh, if we just want to try to trace populism back to say the financial crisis of 2000, 2007, 2008, uh, that's not really going to work because whatever is going on has been going on for much, much, much longer. And also if we want to just trace populism back to say blue collar workers who are frustrated or people in small towns who are frustrated, uh, that's not going to work either because we can see that the erosion of confidence has happened amongst highly educated and uh, higher educated and, and, and less educated people. So what the, what the book really argues is that there's, there's something odd that's going on in the current discourse about populism. And if you, if you listen to these arguments, ultimately what they seem to be, they seem to be taking the position that when, when the people are angry and they say they're frustrated that they've lost control of government, these conventional views are essentially taking the position that they're having something like a temper tantrum and that we, to understand what's going on, we have to penetrate below to find the real meaning of, of what's really driving the, their, their frustration. The contrarian thing that the book argues, first of all, is that, is that you know, maybe, maybe the reason people are, are, are expressing frustration is they, they are in fact losing control of government. So uh, the first chunk of the book is, is really devoted to showing why that's actually happening, to showing that it is happening and showing, and showing, and showing why it's happening. And it, this is, uh, again, I go into a great amount of detail, which I'm not going to go into in the talk. Perhaps it'll come up in the, in the, 
uh, in the discussion, but I can just give you one, I can just give you one example of, of, of one of the things that's going on. One of the really huge factors that's led to, um, to the disconnect between the people and the policies that are happening out there has been the rise of what's called the administrative state. Essentially, government has evolved from, say, 100, 150 years ago to a system where people elected their representatives and their representatives made the laws to a system where now people elect their representatives, but their representatives have turned over the preponderance of lawmaking ability to unelected officials in agencies. And I'll just give you one example of this because I only have time, and this is for the Environmental Protection Agency. So nowadays what happens if Congress wants to, say, uh, get clean drinking water, it might pass the Clean Drinking Water Act. Uh, now, what the Clean Drinking Water Act is, it doesn't actually provide a bunch of rules as far as what we're going to do to clean up the drinking water. It does something like this. This is a quote from, I guess, excuse me, the Safe Drinking Water Act. It says the EPA administrator shall publish uh, goals and promulgate regulations. Okay, so Congress essentially now passes this aspirational laws. It says we want the water to be clear. We're hereby charging the EPA to go out and, and make all the rules, which are effectively laws as for how this happens. So, so, so I, could, I could in the book just give many examples across many different agencies. This has happened across the US, across the world. It happens at the state level too. But we've shifted our governments in a dramatic way from one where, where directly elected representatives make laws to one where unelected, let's say, technocrats make laws. There's actually very good reasons uh, for, for having done that. Uh, the world's become very complicated. We need to use experts. And so, and so this is, on the whole, has been a very sensible thing. What, it, what it's had is an unanticipated side effect and that it's it's put a, a, a much much more it's put a much much more links in the chain between the people and the laws, and it's bred a feeling that the people have lost control of their government to some extent. So what do we do about this? So part one of the book is really establishing that we do have a problem that we have the people have the people the populists are kind of right in the sense that the people have lost some control of their of their government. What do we do about this? Well, the predominant view is that populism is something like a temper tantrum and the people are just being irrational. They don't appreciate all the good things they're getting from having, from having this administrative state. And the basic idea is that we ought, to, we ought to really kind of double down on what we're doing. And this has led to a bunch of books and I just picked out, out a few here, which have basically said, look, the people are just too unreasonable and they don't appreciate all the good things that we elites are doing for them. So let's just back away from democracy to some extent. So we have books like 10% Less Democracy Against Democracy, the people have spoken and they're wrong. Uh, I, I could go on. There, 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 there's a whole bunch of this. There's a whole, whole genre of this. And, and so this is one, one view of the elites, is that the way we're going to cure democracy is by, is by uh, moving away from it and putting elites in charge. Uh, what, what my book argues is, again, somewhat contrarian, is that we should go down the other path and actually make the system more democratic. Uh, hence the title, let, let the People Rule. The challenge is, how do you do this and still keep experts into the system? Uh, it would be foolish and I think uh, almost unimaginable to go backward in time and to say shrink government down and not have agencies and not have experts and, and not have technocrats involved. The question is, is how do you keep expertise in there but give the people more of a say in what actually happens in, in government? So, so the big part of the book is actually outlining, outlining how, how they would do that. Um, in, in, great, in great detail, but let me just, I, I think it might be interesting if I just throw out a, a couple of facts uh, here, and, and this might be more interesting than, than going through some of, some of the detailed arguments at this point. But I'm acutely aware that for many people, especially in the United States, the idea of asking people to vote on issues is very counterintuitive. Uh, they don't understand why you would do that. They have Brexit in mind or, or, or other types of stories or California, and they say, why, why would you do that? One of the most common things I hear uh, when I talk about this is people say, uh, pundits say, well, the people don't want to actually vote on issues. Americans don't want to vote on issues. Uh, but in fact, uh, we have survey after survey after survey say Americans do want to vote on issues, including national issues. Uh, so this was, a, I plucked this number out of a, a Pew survey from a couple years ago, 67% of Americans say they actually do want to vote on important national issues. The, this comes through uh, in survey after survey. As an interesting aside, it's also true of just about every country in the world, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, people want to vote on issues. The thing that I think might be surprising for Americans is that almost all countries in the world do vote on national issues. Uh, just, uh, there's, again, there's lots of information in the book, but I just plucked a num couple numbers that might be interesting. Uh, just in Europe, there's 44 nations in Europe that have actually had national votes on issues uh, in the 21st century. So it's extremely common. Uh, including more than 50, 50 referendums on issues related to European integration uh, alone. Moreover, Americans do vote on issues all the time at the state and the local level. 
Uh, I don't know how many, I suspect uh, there could be a high fraction of people watching who may be from Chicago area or in Illinois. There's, there's a very big uh, constitutional amendment coming up there having to do with the income tax. But Americans vote on issues all the time at the state and local level. Uh, every single constitutional amendment in any state other than one has to be approved by the voters. Voters vote on bond measures, they vote on taxes, they vote on school district budgets. So the notion of voting on issues isn't, isn't, very, it isn't incompatible with American democracy. In fact, it's been part of American democracy from the very beginning. We always vote on, national, we always vote on issues, just not, nat, just not national issues. So part, of the, so part of the book is to tell people that, okay, I understand there might be some resistance to this notion of, of voting on, on national issues. But I suspect that part of that is, especially from American point of view, is, is because of perhaps a blind spot that we've developed in this country. And we're not recognizing that the US is really an extreme outlier. We're one of very few countries, maybe three or four countries in the world now that have never voted on a national issue. So the very last thing I wanna say is, uh, in stopping here, is, is how would we actually do this? The book lays out a number, a number of, of, of possibilities. What I think we need to actually start with, as we, is, is if we were to go down this path, is to start with advisory votes. Um, um, uh, the Congress could do this very quickly. Uh, the Congress could take a vote uh, right away and basically ask people, what do you guys think of a uh, border wall? Do you wanna, you, wanna, you wanna build a border wall or not? Or what do you wanna think about a, a path uh, to citizenship for people who are in the country Ill illegally? Um, you could take votes on those sort of things in, right away. So, so there's many ways one can do this that aren't doing a dramatic uh, change to the constitutional structure. The two big issues, and this is the last, the last two things I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say here, is that the two big questions which I think are in people's minds, first of all, can we trust voters to do this? So there's a lot of evidence on this in the, so, in the social sciences now, and the book goes through that in a very accessible way, but I hope that people will read that and understand that voters are actually quite competent based, based on the evidence. They're not perfect, they make mistakes just like legislators do, but overwhelmingly voters seem reasonably competent. And the second and last thing I want to mention is that, is that there's an added virtue to, ref, to referendums is that the referendum decisions add a, a substantial amount of legitimacy to, to decisions. People accept referendum decisions. And so there's a hope that that might, that might calm some of the partisan waters that, that are going on. And the book has a discussion, which I'll, I'll just allude to here because I think it's, it's something that I've, I've just been fascinated by um, uh, and I continue to think about it, but it has to do with the way abortion, the issue of abortion was treated in Italy and the United States. As most people know, in the United States, abortion was legalized uh, through a court ruling, uh, a, ju a judicial fiat of the US Supreme Court, where in Italy it was legalized through a referendum. And what the book does is it traces through the aftermath of that and what happened. And, and the, the, the bottom line is that in the US, as everybody knows, abortion remains 30, 40 years later, one of the most polarizing issues in the country. Uh, in Italy, it just sort of vanished. And, and I argued that part of that was because of the way, the way it was done. So, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, I'm going to stop here with, with, with that, I suppose. I think I kept to my time more or less, Luigi. Yes, you did. Thank you very much. And now is the turn for Barry. Uh, let me take this off, too. Take this his, off. His comments. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Luigi, for the invitation to, uh, to read this ex exceptionally stimulating book uh, and offer some comments that I hope will be somewhat stimulating. Uh, this is a, a great book for me to read because much of what I know about direct democracy, like most political scientists, I've learned from John's work. So he has been one of the leaders in social science in this field. Uh, his classic work in the American Economic Review, uh, his book for the many or the few, uh, they have all been part of this modern reevaluation of the initiative process that, that points out this irony, which is that all academics hate the initiative process, except for the academics who actually study the initiative process. So, and I think maybe this is part of sort of our uh, interest in expert rule is that is that academics have been very worried for for a century in, in the American states about the about direct democracy. And modern work has shown that there are many areas in which it does function according to to its original goals. And this idea, you know, that that starts with Woodrow Wilson saying the cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. And that's very much the argument that John is making in this book. And I think much of it is supported by the evidence. And I'll talk, I can talk about some areas, many areas of agreement that I have with him. But Luigi has promised that, that, that he wants to stoke the fires and get us, uh, get us engaged in a, in a conflictual debate. And, and, and so I'll, I'll save him the trouble and start off with what highlighting a few areas uh, of, of disagreement that I hope we can get into in greater depth as we get into the conversation. Um, so, so this book really makes two arguments, right? One is that uh, is that American democracy has drifted away from the people, and that has given rise to populism. And the second 
is that the solution to that is direct democracy. So let's focus on that first argument. And, and the first argument is really two arguments, right? So one, it's that there's been this, this movement away from the people. And second, th that has been what has made people feel like they have less of a voice in government. So you saw that graph that John started with, that he, that he begins with on, on page three, that he really sets out to explain in the first half of the book. Um, and that, that's, that that has fueled modern populism with some of our prominent presidential candidates in the last few years. And, and first, I think he makes a, a cogent argument uh, that, is, that is convincing in many ways about the rise of the administrative state, about how, how the regulatory process, which is just as muscular, muscular in, in its legal force as, as the lawmaking process, has, has been, become the locus of, of important policymaking in America. Um, and, and you've seen this, this echoes work like Ted Lowy's The End of Liberalism, this echoes work in economics by people like Bill and this Cannon. To me, though, the problem is I don't think it explains the time trend that he's st starting out trying to explain. Right? So what he shows is, is that there's been this big drop in, in people's feelings of trust in government or efficacy. It starts right around 1970. You know, until 1970, 80% of the, of, of the educator respondents and 60% of those with no college degrees felt like people like them had a say in government. And then it really goes down. It rises, surprisingly, from the 90s to 2000, and then it falls again. And what I'm missing is an explanation that fits that. Because the administrative state was really constructed long in advance of that, right? So we have the rise through uh, through the 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 the, the great um, the New Deal of uh, and and also in the Teddy Roosevelt era of, of these technocrats. We have the passage of the Administrative Procedures Act, something John points out rightly is a key act, but that's right after World War II. And so this administrative state that has been built, and the people like Lowy are, are lodging the same sorts of complaints that John lodges today was already built at the time, at the beginning of the time trend that, that he's trying to explain. Um, and then the second claim here is that, that, that we're in this particularly populist moment. Uh, and, and he quotes Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump with these arguments that the people need to be more in charge. And, and I think one thing to, to, to be skeptical about is whether that's really something new in American politics. You know, every, po every presidential candidate says that they're going to put the people in charge. Every member of Congress runs against Congress. Politicians have forever run against Washington, right? Run against the DC establishment. I think the only politician in American history who didn't run against Washington was probably George Washington. So, so I'm not sure that this is a new moment, nor am I sure that, that Donald Trump is, <laughs> that our president really embodies populism in a real way. So, so John tells this glorious history of populism starting with the expansion of suffrage, the direct election of governors and senators, going to civil rights and the voting rights movement of the 50s and 60s. I'm not sure that the president is, is the natural heir to that strain of populism in American history. Uh, he did give this drain the swamp speech, but he hasn't followed up about any of those policies. And, and I think that's fine, right? He doesn't, he, I don't think he, he that was the, the, the reason behind his candidacy. And so, uh, and so I don't know that today's version of populism is, is well explained by the important trends uh, that John is outlining that brings a drift away from the people. So now let's go to the question of sort of how bad things are in government and will direct democracy fix it? And here I'm going to draw on mostly evidence from uh, the modern American states because that's, I think, the best test bed that we have for direct democracy. So as John shows, it's, it's been present in, in about half the states and, and, and in all states in various forms, but it's, you know, it's citizen initiative is, is present in about half the states that gives us the ability to see whether that brings policy more closely in line with what the people want. And, and, and so looking at the evidence of that, I don't see strong evidence that that institution across the American states brings things, brings the, peop, the politics policy more in line with what the people want. Um, one, how strong is the problem? So John has a very nice and creative uh, new, new set of data that he brings in from eight states where he looks at how they vote on, how legislators and then their voters in their districts voted on referendums, laws that were then put up um, for a public vote. And, 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 and he finds that the legislators only get this right about 65% of the time. That's not a great grade, but I think it's important to note that this is not just a random selection of bills that legislators voted on. 
These are bills specifically that interest, their political opponents thought the legislature was out of step with the people and they thought they could win by taking them to the people. So most of these are, are ones, you know, where there's a petition referendum that puts them up for a vote or the state constitution sort of anticipating this disjuncture requires them to come up for a vote. So there's a, a, there's a, a sort of non-random selection process here where another way of saying that is these are the cases where legislators are least likely to do well and then still they do fairly well. Um, if you look at the, the big re other research programs that have been done, uh, looking at the link between the people and the voters, you see in the 1980s, Erickson, Wright, and McIver had this big set of studies it put together in a book called State House Democracy that shows that in general, voting, you know, in the more liberal states, you get more liberal policies. Some scholars tried to extend that to show and found initially that, uh, that states with direct democracy actually did worse. Uh, in, in that link, John effectively rebutted that in, in work in the 90s, showing, showing that there were big statistical problems with doing that. But none of that evidence showed that direct democracy states did any better. The next set of studies comes in with the democratic deficit work uh, by, by Lax and Phillips that John covers uh, and uh, that looks at do, when, when you have a policy like abortion where you can say, here's what the voters want, here's what the voters get, are they congruent, does policy match, um, does policy match what the voters want? What we see is strong democratic deficit in the states, about 50% of the time the legislature gets it right. And as John says in his book, that's a coin flip. So the question is, is direct democracy the solution? And Lax and Phillips actually directly address that in their study. And they look and they find absolutely no effect of, direct, of the citizen initiative on bringing a closer link between politicians and, uh, and the voters. Um, what does matter? More professional legislatures get it right more of the time and term limits, states with term limits get things right most of the time. So one of those is populist, one of those is anti-populist, uh, which I think points out the complexities in finding the solution to the democratic deficit. But again, they find absolutely no effect and it's insignificant, but in fact, it goes the opposite direction of what they expect with direct democracy states doing worse. Uh, and then finally, there's a, a new and extremely promising research program that, uh, that Devin Coey and Chris Warshaw are doing in a set of articles that will culminate in a book soon where they look over eight decades of data showing how pol uh, public opinion changes within states lead to policy changes. And what they show in their work, uh, there's a 2018 um, uh, article in the APSR, our flagship journal, it shows that, that states in fact do, when the, pol when the polity shifts to the left or the right, the states respond with the right policies, but they find that uh, in their words, dynamic responsiveness has increased over time, but does not seem to be influenced by institutions such as direct democracy or campaign finance regulations. So again, the states with the initiative process do no better than the other states in doing that. And so I think what all of this research should show us is direct democracy may not be the, the panacea for the, the, the problem that, that, that John you know, really correctly illustrates in the states. Um, so then maybe it's not a problem, maybe it's not a solution, but does direct democracy cause any problems? Um, let, me, let me lay out, uh, let me just say that, that I agree with John, that, that I think voters are up to the task and there's a lot of good evidence showing that they are. Um, I think that he makes, in this book, I appreciate, he makes the proper comparison between the initiative process and the actual legislative process, not some Republican ideal. And I think that's very helpful. And I think finally, he makes the really important point that the direct democracy allows the people to change policies without changing their representatives. And I think that's important in this area when we're worried about some populist leaders bringing in democratic backsliding or a tendency towards autocracy. And, and you see that in Europe. So, so the direct, direct democracy allows voters to do something like have a tax revolt, Prop 13, but not throw out a governor, Jerry Brown, who, who they might like. It sort of unpackages policy. So I think some of the common ills uh, that are pointed out of the direct democracy system, John effectively rebuts in this book. But here are just a few things, and I'm happy to go into depth on more of them and happy to, to talk through Prop 13, which is a California initiative that, that, he throw, that, that he discusses in depth and talk about how it might illustrate some of these problems. But here are the, the, the flaws that, that I see in, in the initiative process. Um, so, so one is that whoever controls the agenda 
exerts huge control over the eventual outcomes. So in, in economics and political science for a long time, we've seen with Arrow's theorem and, and with the Romer Rosenthal agenda setting model, we've seen this problem where if you can set the agenda, structure the choice and make a take it or leave it offer to the voters, you can give them, you can win, even if you give them something that's only barely better than the status quo, not something that moves to the center and gives voters exactly what they want. So direct democracy benefits whoever controls the agenda. Well, who controls the agenda in direct democracy? In the referendum systems that John's talking about, that where a national legislature puts things out, that's, that's something that gives a lot more control to the politician. But in the way it's practiced in many states uh, and, and the citizen uh, initiative process that John throws out as one potential national solution, it really means rich interest groups are going to play this role, right? The price of getting a ballot, an initiative on the ballot in a state uh, like California is now two to three million dollars because paid signature gatherers, who by the way, have been around for the entire history of the initiative process. 1908 is the first time that a state bans paid signature gathering, showing that it's been around forever, right? These people, whether they're the interest groups that can pay that or the billionaires, people like Molly and Charles Munger, T. Boone Pickens, others who have personally financed initiatives on the ballot in California, they are the people who get to structure the choice. So if we had a re national referendum, it wouldn't just be about these issues of grave national importance that people you know, in these polls that John cites say they wanna vote about, it would be about the issues that interest groups that have the money to qualify it for the ballot want you to vote on and they'd structure the choice in the way that benefited their side. Um, second, one of the biggest problems uh, that people uh, say, that people lodge to the, to the question of sort of letting the people rule is who are those people? So in a lot of elections, uh, the, the electorate is, is, is skewed and the authors of direct democracy initiatives play to that skew. So um, Zoli Heinel's work and Sarah Anzi's work show that interest groups back initiatives and they, they time them to be on the ballot in off-cycle elections in ways that will bring out their supporters, either on the left or on the right. Uh, Vlad Kogan's work shows that uh, looking at school bond referendums in five states shows that they, the ones held during off-cycle elections bring out low have low turnout with more elderly voters uh, and younger voters members of non-white ethnic groups and people with incomes below 40,000, they're underrepresented. And so it's a different group of people who are having the voice heard. And then finally, this points us back to, to this problem with direct democracy of letting the people rule where there's always the worry that when you do let the majority of the people rule, that this will trample minority rights. And work by Liz Gerber and Zoli Heinel shows that uh, that members of uh, of minority groups are very often are consistently on the losing end of ballot initiatives in California on things like illegal immigration and affirmative action. Members of the LGBT community were on the losing side of two defensive marriage acts in California, and we've seen others across the country. And and there's a worry that initiatives can even lock in this problem. So one of the things Prop 13 did was it said that future uh, votes in California to raise taxes at the local level, things like school bonds, had to pass by a supermajority. And we see time and time again, initiatives with uh, you know, tax measures at the local level, school bonds at the local level with strong support, but not supermajority support losing because the people haven't had the chance to rule because a past initiative that changed the constitution, that changed the rules of the game, locked in uh, the, the power of one group over another. So those are some of the problems that I see uh, and, and I look forward to getting into a conversation about this solution. So thank you very much, Ted. Um, you are pretty aggressive in this association. <laughs> Basically, uh, the history does not explain the facts and uh, is uh, the benefits of referendum he claims are not there. Uh, and by the way, referendums are not that good to begin with. So uh, John, I'm sure you had a lot of uh, uh, things to say. Why don't you start by, uh, I don't wanna have another 15 minutes rebuttal, but that, why don't you start to say what, what strikes you as most unfair what Tad said? 
Yeah, let me and let me be sure because I saw there's some great questions in, in, in the Q&A too. And, and thanks Thad, for those comments. Uh, that's a nice things about me, but I, I hope it's important. I think it's useful to mention that's done a lot of great research in this area as one of the experts. So, so one absolutely has to listen to, to what he has to say. Uh, let me just say, let me just say, say two things on the issue on the issue of, of timing. Um, so we've seen that the public opinion has, has been drifting down over time. Certainly some of the biggest movements happened in the 1970s. Can we really tie this back to the administrative state or not? Um, I, I think there's some kind of technical issues in there, which are, and I don't mean to dismiss them by, by, saying, by, by saying they're technical, but sort of really pulling out when, when public opinion moved and, and, what, and what caused it in terms of these secular things are, are, are tricky. I, I, do, I, I do think that my intuition is that Essentially, what happened is we built this administrative state starting around the 1910s. Uh, after the Second World War, as, as, as Dad mentioned, uh, the Congress started to started to notice that they had constructed an administrative state and they wanted to cut it back a little bit, so they passed the Administrative Procedures Act. I would say it took people a while, but I, th I think the I think the financial crisis was an eye opener for a number of people. They had had an unsettling feeling about things, and it kind of opened their eyes to a bunch of things. So I think it it, it sort of triggered something. As far as Trump, I, I completely agree. I, I don't think Trump is a, 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 it's hard to know what Trump really stands for, but, but I don't think Trump uh, came out of this with some, with some really deep theory of populism and so forth. I think Trump, like most politicians, frankly, is just retailing what he thinks will sell. Uh, and he's giving voice to an argument that seems to resonate without maybe necessarily understanding exactly where it's coming from. So, so, that's, so that's the thing. But I think it is pointing out a bigger problem with populism in general and why we should care about it is that if, if we allow this to continue to fester in our system where more and more voters uh, start to think the system is, is rigged in some sense or it doesn't work for the people, I, I think that there's a danger that they'll start increasingly turn to anti-democratic uh, um, processes. And we've seen this happen in other parts of the world where sort of, you know, you, you end up in dictatorships and stuff. I'm not saying we're, 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 we're there now, but I think those are the things which are underlying it. As far as whether direct democracy works or not, I want to be really clear. I'm not really suggesting that, that the that the problems that we're facing and other democracies are facing are going to be solved in, in any way by taking some votes. I don't think that at all. Um, I think it's going to take a multidimensional solution. I think American democracy has a number of undemocratic elements to it, ranging from the, uh, the electoral college to unequal representation of senators by states and so forth. I think we're going to have to work on all those to, to really do it. I think direct democracy is one piece of the puzzle, though, that hasn't been talked about. So what I'm really throwing out here is to suggest that people think about it. I don't necessarily think people will read the book and come away saying, okay, I didn't like it now I think it's a great idea but I hope they'll think it's reasonable just one last thing just kind of on a on a I don't want to go into the technical point but I think some people are interested in this point about Lax and Phillips paper which is a which is a great a great great paper on, on congruence as, as Thad said one of the main findings of Lax and Phillips is that one of the best predictors of congruence is whether a state has term limits or not uh, so that's one of their main findings the important thing to note is that whether you have term limits or not is one-to-one -one whether you have initiatives because all the states that adopted term limits adopted it through the initiative process so again there's a statistical inference point there but but if you think about it i actually think their result actually is pretty good for 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 the effect of direct democracy so thanks thank you very much john and uh let me bring in uh, since you brought the the time experience first of all a small uh, technical qualification that doesn't change the substance. Uh, in Italy, abortion was introduced by a law, but then there was a national referendum that decided whether to abrogate or not. Uh, but you're absolutely right that in a Catholic country, 65% uh, of the people said that they would go along with a new law, they would not want to abrogate the law. And this was voted in 1981, was actually the first ballot I ever cast in my life, and uh, was never discussed again. So I think that. Uh, uh, if you compare the United States and Italy, I think the referendum is, is, uh, uh, gives Italy a much better score in that dimension. And I'm surprised that none of, the, of you mentioned a case of success, in my view, in the United States. The uh, legalization of marijuana in many states was introduced through referenda or by the threat of referenda. And, and I think that this is the classic thing that uh, uh, people are afraid to do politically. And, uh, is pretty much uh, uh, orthogonal to many other sort of political views. And this is a good thing to be introduced to the referendum. And, and I think that uh, the aspect that I don't see discussed enough is what are the mechanisms to which referendum are introduced? Because Ted said um, agenda setting is very different than if you are like in Italy, where you can only abrogate an existing law, or if you have a popular initiative, and now this popular initiative is sort of uh, um, uh, 
finance or is uh, implemented. And, uh, and I agree that uh, it is far from perfect, uh, but I think it brings an alternative. So to that, I would like to ask, do you think that, the, for example, the legalization of marijuana would have taken place in the same way without referendum? I think it would have been much slower. So I think I think that's that's a fair point. This was this was something that, along with same-sex marriage, has seen the most uh, di the the biggest transformation in public opinion over the last decade or so. So this went from something you know when I was a legislative staffer uh, in the late '90s in California, it was an absolute fringe issue. Uh, that, that no one wanted to touch. Now, by the time it got to pass in California, it was not a fringe issue. And it was one where Gavin Newsom, who was you know, planning his run for, for, for the governorship, strongly endorsed it. So it's something where I think it would have happened in the next three to five years in, the, uh, in government, if it was, it, through, sorry, through, uh, through representative government in, in a state like California, if it hadn't happened in the initiative process. But I think the initiative process allowed the public uh, to move more quickly, to get out in front of politicians, to to pass something where uh, where the where the the leading party, Democrats in California, were split with people like Dianne Feinstein opposed and people like Gavin Newsom uh, in favor of legalization. So so I agree with you that on these on these fast changing issues, where there was a clear like either you pass it or you don't, right? It was a clear there wasn't a lot of room for agenda control on this binary issue uh, that it did move. Uh, policy more closely in, into into what the people wanted, um, and, and but I think it's also important to, to note that many issues don't have that just sort of binary effects. Many issues in politics are multidimensional, and one of the big concerns about the initiative process is that it allows voters to only vote on one dimension. And then forces the legislature and often the courts to then try to take care of the other dimensions to try to figure out how to actually implement marijuana. So right, we see in California, the legislature and local governments have to implement it. And so they've got to figure out voters want to be able to buy marijuana, but don't want to have marijuana dispensaries in their dis in their areas. And so what we've seen is, is this huge uh, trend towards towards uh, pushing marijuana dispensaries all into one area, not having people able to get it. And in, in Los Angeles Times analysis done last year, the price of legal marijuana is still higher than the price of black market marijuana because all of the regulations that the legislature passed in, and state and local governments have passed in response to, to what their constituencies have wanted have made this law very hard for it to actually have its intended effect. Luigi, can I add please. one thought on that? Yeah, please. Yeah, just because I think it might be interesting for people who are not that familiar with this. So marijuana is a great example. I, I think it would uh, unlikely to, to have seen it, it legal. It's now legal in, in, for 25% of the population. A whole bunch of states have done this. But there's a whole bunch of other issues that it's very hard to imagine the legislature would have moved on. And I just I was jotting down a few uh, notions here. One for sure is term limits. A lot of states have passed term limits, as we mentioned. They never would have done it without. Uh, Nonpartisan redistricting. Many states have used initiative process to take redistricting out of the hands of legislatures and put it into a nonpartisan commission. Uh, open primaries is another one where it's hard to believe legislatures would have agreed to do it. The, the other point, which I think is connected to all, all this, is it's really important to recognize that, that when we talk about referendums and direct democracy, this isn't a stalking horse for the left or for the right. Uh, you can find plenty of examples of right-wing issues and left-wing issues that, that come down. Uh, marijuana is typically thought of as a left-wing issue, but of course it's been, uh, direct democracy has been used for tax cuts and for limited government issues on some areas. Animal rights issues have had, uh, have had their day. So it, it really goes across the spectrum. So I think one should think of this as an institutional reform that's making government more democratic, not as a way to get more left-wing or more right-wing policies. I think that I see it as kind of an extra safety device to fix democracy when they're blocked. And uh, precisely when it comes to fixing issues that, uh, uh, the, where the legislation of a conflict of interest, like ter term limits, is very hard for having uh, turkeys voting for Thanksgiving, and it's very hard to have a, a member of uh, Congress vote for term limits. So I think that that's a, that's a very a fail safe device that might be useful. But in your book, John, uh, you point out one uh, very important point, and many people, I think, don't appreciate. I didn't appreciate it until you, you brought it up, that um, even if most people are not uh, familiar with individual issues, I think the referenda 
can allow them to uh, vote uh, inform or vote as if they were informed. If there is a rich set of intermediaries that uh, take position and they can ally themselves with these intermediaries or not. But so this uh, actually raises, in my view, a very important question, which is to what extent um, the new world of social media we live in is uh, good or bad for uh, referenda. It's good or bad to provide that information that allows the referendum to uh, be a good way to sort out preferences. So, so that's a big unknown. I don't. I guess I don't claim to know what the the world of social media changes so fast and is is so far reaching. I don't. I don't claim to have a, a good a, a deep insight. But the, the point the point the point you're raising, I think, is really a central a central point. If I if I had had more time, that would have been the, the number one thing I would have added in. And it's one of the questions that came up there. And that we we know that if you ask voters about individual issues, they're unable to tell you in a lot of detail. Uh, they can't give you deep policy analysis and so forth. The really important thing to recognize is that when people vote, they're they, they, they don't need to know in detail the issues they're voting on. They simply need to know a recommendation from a trusted source. And the example I often like to give is that if there's a, if there's a measure on the ballot, which is called the, the forest protection measure, the, what the voter needs to know is, is, whether, is whether they should vote for it or not. They don't need to know actually the details of the law. And it's, suppose you're an environmentalist. In, and you want to know whether it's actually going to protect forests or whether it's a timber industry measure that's going to allow more, more, uh, more, more cutting on, on, on national parks. Well, all you really need to know is what's the endorsement of the Sierra Club. Uh, and then you can decide what, what, the, what the right way to vote is. And in fact, that's the way that most voters work. Uh, pretty good research tells us uh, work, work by Arthur Lupia was fundamental in this, but there's been a whole, whole generation of, of research uh, after that. It doesn't work perfect, but it's really important to realize that the, the standard here of competence is not whether voters can recite back and repeat in detail uh, the, the actual statutory language that they're facing, but whether they can cast a vote that reflects their underlying interest. And there's actually pretty good evidence that they that they can do this quite often. Now, social media, I actually think will probably help because I think more information is better. They'll be able to find easier affinity groups that that will be able to tap into, um, be able to tap into their core interest. Um, but it's the wild west out there with social media right now. So, I, so I, I remained <laughs> my, I'm, I'm I'm prepared to change my views on that as time as things evolve. So, Fad, what is your view on this? Yeah, so I think uh, in, in if uh, people use social media like uh, like civics teachers wanted them to use social media, we have lots of tools. In fact, one CaliforniaChoices.org for California initiatives, uh, which I've been involved in, helps. It says has information about how uh, people, uh, how all these interest groups uh, like the Sierra Club uh, have uh, suggested you vote on every initiative, and then you can find out information. You can create your own set of endorsements, and then it has a little tool where you can share that out on your social media at strands to, to all your friends. I think for the 1% of people who, who like to in, use that, <laughs> engage with on social media about direct democracy, that will work. But I think for, for a vast number of people, it'll just be simply another competing information source pulling you away from that. But I think, I think, it, and so I think first, John is absolutely right uh, that this modern strand of social science research the, that, that he's been a big part of has shown that, that voters have the ability to say, between yes or no on this initiative, which is the best choice for us, All right? But that doesn't mean that having, that this is a better choice than, than other alternative processes that, that, could, that could deal with policy. And in particular, the one problem with the initiative process is you don't have to, is that Leg initiatives don't have to pay for themselves, right? So when a legislature has to make a decision, it has to figure out how to pass the policy and then actually have to implement it. It has to figure out what to spend money on and then where to get that money, right? And so you have something like Prop 13, like a tax cut initiative, or something like some of the more recent uh, service increasing uh, initiatives in California that haven't paid for themselves with any source of funding. Then you have a legislature that needs to, so I think voters can say, yeah, I'd like to have lower taxes. Yeah, I'd like to have this new program and interest groups can help point us in the right direction. But then there's a series of choices that need to be made to actually implement them. And the book, uh, Stealing the Initiative by many of the people that John has cited here shows that legislators that often 
take away the stop an initiative from being implemented in the way that the voters want uh, because they have the power to actually implement it. They have to make these tough choices. They have to make those trade-offs uh, and, and they see their political goals aligned with uh, not making those trade-offs. And so often we see the will of the people frustrated. They make an initial decision that fits with their interests, but then either the courts or the legislature fail to implement it or throw it out. And, and that I think could lead to potentially more distrust in government and in the long term, more alienation from, from the people in power that could fuel the rise, continued rise of populism. Your answer uh, uh, is very uh, related to a question that, that was raised here. Uh, and the question by Tiago Santos is, uh, Brennan and Buchanan argue that voters cast, cast their vote expressively. And uh, Darwin finds a lot of evidence for this hypothesis. What risk does direct democracy bring if voters are not voting their interest, but voting expressively? Mm, that's, that's an interesting question. The, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm pausing on that is that there is actually a lot of evidence. That it, it's absolutely right that if we think about why do, why do, people, why do people go to the polls, they, it, it doesn't seem that they're going to the polls primarily because they expect their vote to matter, at least in, in a large electorate. They're, they're going more as a, as a way of ex just expressing their opinions. The reason I'm hesitating is because at the same time, we have, we have a lot of evidence that suggests there's very, there's very close alignments between votes and people's interests. Uh, uh, you will see that people work in certain industries consistently vote for, for measures that help their industry and against things that, 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 that hurt them. So I think there's, there's really pretty overwhelming evidence that suggests that people find a way, maybe when they're, when they're expressively voting, but they're expressing support for, for things that we would expect uh, to, to, matter, to matter to them. So, so I don't know if that's a great, a great answer, but off the top of my head. I mean, I think that makes sense because the initiative process, and John points this out, it forces people to actually live with their choices that they make, right? By empowering them, it means that, that they are, they've got to live by whatever the decision was made. And it takes away this incentive to kind of, to, to, uh, to cast a vote that sends a message to a politician. So very often, some of the evidence that we have of expressive voting is, uh, you know, things like, you know, in, to, to go to Europe, uh, in European parliament elections, people will vote against the party uh, who's in power domestically. So they're trying to send a message that they want people to change mid-course. And the European parliament election, even though it doesn't affect who's in power in their own country, this is the only chance they have to voice their displeasure and get someone to actually change their action. And the initiative process, you don't have that problem, right? Your vote and the, the collective voice on this initiative is actually going to change policy um, with the complexities of implementation that I've laid out. And so I think it does force voters to think as instrumentally as possible because of, of, the, of the, the impact of their choices. So another viewer, Mark Shapiro, says, Thanks for such a robust discussion and research. And then say, regarding running against Washington, are you concerned, so you, John, are you concerned that so many leaders of our government are so expressively anti-government? Does any other modern institution market against itself so much? So I'm not an expert on, on, on uh, a lot of other countries, but my suspicion is that the U.S. is, is probably on the on one end of the spectrum uh, uh, as far as, as hostility toward, toward the central government. And I, I, I suppose it goes back to the very beginning. There's always been a, uh, uh, a suspicion of central authority with, with, within the U.S. Am I concerned that people run, run against uh, government? Um, not, I think it can be taken too, 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 too far, uh, but, but, I, but I think it's, it's, not, it's not unhealthy. Uh, to be somewhat skeptical of the people that, that rule us. I think you can go back to the founding fathers uh, uh, had, had some hesitancy about whether they were creating a central government that, that was too, too powerful. And I think they cautioned, uh, they cautioned us to be always on watch. Thomas Jefferson particularly uh, uh, made some almost incendiary statements uh, uh, going a long time ago. But I, uh, I, I, I do think it, it starts to be of concern to me if you see people pushing in an anti-democratic vein. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we're, we're exactly in the danger zone right, right now, but, but I think we see some language that, that kind of gets like that. And again, if you, go to, if you go to parts of Latin America, you've had populist guys come into power uh, 
really who are who actually end up creating um, um, dictatorships. And, and I think if you really boil it down, I think to some extent what happens in those cases is that is if, if ordinary people at some point become so convinced the system is rigged that there's some sort of elites that are going to run it and it's not going to be a democracy, they say, well, okay, if, it, if it's not going to be a democracy, if it's going to be a dictatorship, I'd rather have my dictator in there than the rich guy's di dictator. And that's where you're in a very, very bad situation. Again, I don't think, I don't think we're, we're, we're there yet, but I don't, want us, I don't want us to get anywhere near that territory. Speaking of, there is a question by Kylie Cabana that said, asked to John, do you believe votes on national issue in the United States, which has a two-party system, would have the same popular legitimacy as votes on national issues in Europe? which are mostly multi-party systems? So, so leg I mean, that's a hard question for me to answer because the, even the concept of legitimacy is, is a bit hard to, to pin down. I think we kind of we know what it is. Um, I, believe that, I believe that votes on national issues in the US would have more legitimacy than the other ways that we're currently making decisions. I, I think that vote on an issue would have more legitimacy than having, say, a nine unelected um, justices on the U.S. Supreme Court making decisions, uh, or or having laws made by an an, an, an unelected um, official in an, in an in an agency. So, um, so, so I don't know if how it would be compared to, to Europe. And again, I'm going to plead that I'm not I'm not quite an expert in Europe. Certainly, it's not that Europeans completely endorse their outcomes either. Brexit, of course, in the U.K. was a very controversial thing. Many people doubted the legitimacy of, of that vote for, for reasons that I discuss in the book. So I don't want to take any, any of this too, too far. I, I don't at all suggest that this is going to be a perfect solution. Uh, but I do think we can do better than we're doing now. Um, that seems like like a pretty low bar, if that's uh, the point. But uh, uh, so speaking of, they, there is David Stout that is asking: Would voting on Sundays, as in Europe, create a larger voter participation rate? Stout, I don't know. Probably. What? <laughs> Well, oh, you know, uh, many states are going to have the opportunity to do that as we have more, more and more early voting. Uh, but the biggest difference between the United States and, and other nations uh, in voting, the thing that explains why our voting participation rate is lower is, is the huge hurdles to registration. So getting people who are registered out to vote is not that hard. Getting people registered uh, is, is, the big, is the big difference. Many, many other countries have registration automatic, or at least the barriers are much lower. Registration, uh, the automatic national voter registration is something that has been pushed. The car that was uh, Jimmy Carter's first bill uh, introduced in Congress in his presidency. It's something that's been a long-term push uh, in, in the voting rights community. But for, for reasons political and, and policy, we've seen a lot of opposition to that uh, in, in American history. Um, just and I just wanted to throw one thing out. Going back to the earlier good question about you know, do, will people actually? Why does America hate its government? If you look at polls across the, the nations and ask in the same way, there's there's a paradox because there are two things that Americans are outliers on. One, we're much prouder and patriotic, perhaps jingoistic about our country than everyone else, right? Two we're much more likely to say we want to change its governing institutions. Americans are much more open to reform and changing things. And I think that's why John, who smartly looks at doable reforms that don't require a change to the Constitution, pushes uh, you know, an idea in this, in this book that actually could potentially have legs uh, in, in a country that is open to changing its system because we're unhappy with how it works right now. Uh, last question. Uh, Pagayotis say, thanks for the great discussion. So far, it seems to be revolving around enabling more voting. What about institutions which people no longer trust? Could people vote to abolish the Fed? Would boundaries on what are allowed to vote delegitimize the project? John, what is your view? Yeah, so I, I believe in, in going in, in steps. I, 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 I'm not a uh, I don't think we should jump all in and say, you know, everything's up for votes now. We can abolish the Fed. We can change it. We can repeal the Constitution by popular vote. I think that would be radical. I'm for going in steps and starting small and moving bigger, depending what we learn from it. I think the country's been great at continuing to innovate. Uh, our democracy looks very different from the one that was set up 250 years ago. I think we want to embrace that. We want to continue to, to, try, new, to try new things and see what works. I believe if, as we try more voting on referendums, we'll decide that it works and, and we, want to do, we, we want to do more of it. 
I think the question about the Fed is a really big issue and it gets really to the administrative state issue because we have a lot of decisions now being made with big consequences by unelected officials. The book, and, and I don't have time to go into this, but, but just in a nutshell, the book says we, we, we need to think of a way to demarcate who, what decisions are made by the people and what decisions are made by experts. And what the book suggests is that we want the people to retain the ability to make important value decisions and important sort of broad decisions about what our priorities and then we want to leave implementation details and so forth to 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 the experts so so one could well imagine restraining in some sense what the fed might might do and obviously they they can regulate banks better better than other, better better than we can but but there might be some broad trade offs we might want to make uh, how much we want to bail out banks versus we want to help uh, ordinary homeowners or something like like that that, that that one could imagine that one could imagine voting on and this, uh, this is a perfect uh, closing argument. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Tad, for a great discussion. And uh, I hope to see you both soon, ideally in person. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you.